All right, folks, welcome to another edition of the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast. <laughs> so excited to be here at Amedio's. Uh, I can only imagine what it's uh, been like here at the restaurant the last few weeks, last couple weeks. Um, I know that it was hard to get a parking spot tonight <laughs> when I came in. Yes. Um, so it's it's so funny how uh, the excitement of the you know athletics programs and the things that are going on of course, it certainly didn't hurt that there was a uh, a big event taking place over at Reynolds Coliseum as well. Uh, it, it just drives up and ramps up the excitement here in town, and uh, we are uh, so thankful for the folks here at Amedios, uh that host us each and every week that we are here. Um, you know, like I usually do, and I, I love to give Dave a shout out on on the show. Uh, I said, Dave, you know, we're going to be podcast tonight. We got Scott Wood on the show. You know, what should we talk about? What do you want us to promote? And I think he wrote in all caps, uh, yes, watch the game at Amedios. <laughs> uh, he is, uh, he's very excited about the fact that uh, you can come by Amedios and, and watch the game. Uh, yeah, you, know. you can watch Friday's game, too, because it's at 7 instead of being like the 940 tip. So that's yeah. Nice. yeah, so there's going to be ample opportunities for uh, you, know, you to come by and watch not just NC State, but uh, you know, the fact that uh, – as we're going to t- discuss here in just a second, you know, both the men's and women's teams are now into the Sweet 16. So there's going to be uh, lots of opportunities to watch uh, the games uh, for themselves uh, as they play and then also, uh, you know, their future potential opponents, we hope. Um, so uh, come on down to Medios. I uh, do also want to mention that there are half price apps from four to six, uh, ex- excluding Wings and the Calamari. I believe that is a uh, this screen grab that Dave sent me. I'm not sure uh, what days in particular they are. It might just be during the uh, the I games. Th- I think it's during. No, I think that's during weekdays. Okay, during yeah, weekdays. The, yeah, the half I, price apps are during weekdays, four to six. Right. So I know come, sometimes they've done some specials during game watch situations. But you're right. I think it is. Yeah. Uh, Get your table or early before the seven o'clock tip. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Right. Plant your spot here in Medios. Get here early. Like I said, parking sometimes hard to come by. Yeah. Six ten uh, Central, which is bad news for Modiara. Yeah, so, no, we'll yeah. talk about that in just a bit. But uh, but yeah, the the team heading to Dallas, and and uh, there are some complications for for Mo as a result of that. But uh, uh, hey, it hasn't slowed him down yet. Um, <laughs> let me, as I always do every week, welcome Corey. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> How was Pittsburgh? <laughs> it was uh, cold. Um, but it was a lot of fun. So, uh-huh. yeah, I mean, going inside the gym was a lot more fun than being outside. So, uh, but yeah, the last, last couple of days were nice outside. So I got, I got to go for a couple runs and then okay. go in and watch, uh, some really good basketball. I mean, I, you know, I feel like as far as yeah. the, as far as the Cinderella side of things, like Pittsburgh was basically the epicenter of yeah. it. I mean, you know, obviously Yale, wins but it's like ah well they they, you know they didn't win the next game james madison wins they didn't win the next game well you know oakland and nc state you knew coming out of that one a a top you know a a a double digit seed was going to be moving on to the sweet 16 uh and you know seeing getting to see oakland uh knock off kentucky in Mm -hmm. person before um seeing nc state knock off texas tech uh that was that was a really fun night and then again uh, what you saw on Saturday was was really really fun too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I've mentioned Amedios that takes care of us each and every week. I believe you have an ad read as well. Yeah, these uh, are these are never awkward at all. <laughs> um, and and actually, I, I, do I need to update this by the way? Because <laughs> yeah, um, yeah the, in real time we're having a production meeting with. <laughs> the, yeah, I, I think we are going to have to. Up- <laughs> Change yeah. it. Uh, okay. I hate to say I haven't even looked to see what what is in. There. I can't even remember what's in. There. <laughs> yeah. So, well, because uh, you didn't write it. So. Oh, I, I'm sure my wife wrote yeah. it or somebody else wrote it. So uh, I just made sure everything looked good. And well, the, we'll give this we'll give this read one last one and then whatever yes. you have afterwards. We'll give us some notes. For the next yeah, one. Yeah, we'll, yeah. Yeah. So. You have to give a shout out to the Scott Wood home lending team. Uh, is you, there Scott. anything this man can't do? After a successful career at NC State and playing professional basketball, Scott has turned the sights on conquering the mortgage world. Reach out to him today if you're interested in financing the purchase or build of your dream home, looking to purchase your first investment property, or even <laughs> just to buy land. Great rates in 50 states. Scott, you got unlimited range, man. Yes, what can I say? Yes, you heard that right. The ability to live in all 50 states. Scott is looking forward to sending out those pre approvals and getting your home journey started. See now that I'm older, we can only do 46 states. So I, oh I no! Lost some range, but oh, no. 
I, I think it's some states that we're probably, unless you're living in Alaska listening. Do we have any Alaska <laughs> can we, listeners? Can we qualify Ooh, D.C.? Or yeah, <laughs> we'll are. just throw D.C. in as a state? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a few, but pretty much everything else is the same. But okay. we can make a couple tweaks. You still okay, have okay. that unlimited range. Well, I mean, uh, yes, like you just said, it, it, it's... You should have. It would have been a lot more fun having you in Pittsburgh when uh, when the gym was open. We got to put up some shots, and it was it was embarrassing. So yeah, <laughs> I would have liked uh, when they double and triple teamed uh, DJ Burns. There, I, w- I would have enjoyed that. That'd as have well. been very nice. Yeah, huh? That'd have been a lot of fun. <laughs> I don't think they would have double and triple. Well, I, I say that Casey. I mean, obviously a, a well, reliable even, shooter, but even DJ Horn, they were yeah. double team. I, so I, I just think their priority was to stop. DJ at all costs and live with what what happens. Yeah, exactly. I know it's not what you meant, Scott, but like I had a thought that like you could have an NIL experience sold to the fans of NC State, where it's like you pay a certain amount and then you could be part of a double or triple team on DJ Burns and see if you could stop DJ from <laughs> scoring. I don't know. There'd be some risk involved with that. You'd probably have to sign a waiver or something in advance of it. I would not want to attempt that at all. That <laughs> okay. doesn't sound fun. As a as a uh, a writer, a technician, I tried for two years to get the wrestling team to allow me to oh go and and uh, just try, at, you know, <laughs> not not to try, but to to work out with Darion Caldwell, uh, uh, who was at NC State at the time, who was a you know a national MMA. Champ- <laughs> he was a national champion, future MMA fighter. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know that would have gone horribly awry, but like that would have been funny. You know, yes. you get that on video. Uh, they they did not oblige. They did not allow me to do that. So that that um, is probably the, for probably for my own. <laughs> that is the hubris of self. youth, I think, right there. Uh, the the confidence to to think that you could survive uh, going one on one with Darian Caldwell. Um, I don't know that we properly oh, yeah. introduced our, yeah. our guest, uh, but you see him on the stream, and you of course heard his voice. Scott Wood rejoins us. How are you doing, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing good. I'd be better if you didn't spoil that the NC State women have already advanced to <laughs> Sweet 16 since I haven't seen it yet. But yeah. that's all right. That's well, all right. It's, we'll it's, it's hard. She doesn't uh, hear you, does she? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, you got TVs all around here at the media. It's, it's it's hard to live in a uh, to DVR in a, in a world where you have so many connected devices and so many avenues to have things spoil for you. So I apologize that <laughs> I, I was. I had uh, already seen on TV. Just giving you a hard time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, gosh, uh, I you know t- I don't even know where to start. It's just a uh, there's there's you know uh, I think we too much success to talk about at NC State, which is a yeah different I, thing. I, yeah. I, I somehow joked I don't know how Stanford fans do this because they they win you know titles in every sport uh, all the time and it's just a, a strange thing. But um, you know after the run last week that you know um, you know, gets not only the ACC championship, which I think is a more important thing for this program than just merely getting into the tournament, but with that comes the entry into the NCAA tournament. They continue to play with confidence and now are on to the Sweet 16. Uh, a, a convincing win against Texas Tech, and then, you know, as as the would-be Cinderella story, you then, you know, face the um, preemptive Cinderella story, I guess, in Oakland. Um, Golki and yeah, the the, the what Golki did. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know where we want to start to devour this uh, smorgasbord of uh, content here, but uh, maybe just start with the most recent result. State defeats Oakland uh, and moves on to the Sweet Sixteen. You know, I, I I know obviously you know we love to talk offense a lot, but I really felt like it started with the effort on the defensive end against Golki. I mean. State had the benefit of seeing what he did against Kentucky in that first game, and the team came out prepared. You know, Casey Morsell, Jaden Taylor, DJ Horn, they all did a tremendous job. You know, yes, he still hit six, but I think he had to put up, what, 17? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, a guy that's that capable of hitting him, you know, uh, and I want to get Scott's thoughts on just his shooting ability at some point, just uh, from one shooter to another, but, like, um, you know, we we knew I think the team knew that they had to limit him and make uh, the rest of Oakland beat them and they nearly did, um, yeah. but I really felt like their defensive effort is what uh, got them that win. Yeah, I mean the only thing I'll say really quickly and I, I do want to get your thoughts on on him, but also you know NC State's ability to shut him down and what they did late. I mean the the issue I saw early on was was some over pursuit, uh, trying right. to get after him and 
you know, there was it was a lot of playing catch up as opposed to um, having multiple defenders on him or having somebody that was face guarding him. Uh, they were able to get him, you know, they were able to get him out in some open spots. And then Casey jumped one time. I think it was Michael O'Connell that yeah. uh, that jumped one time. And then uh, Casey fell one time on a you know on a defensive attempt. And you know those things are going to happen every once in a while. And you know sometimes you live with okay, that guy's going to take that shot. You know he's not always going to make it. Well, Golke just for whatever reason in that in that tournament. I mean he was just hitting nearly every open opportunity he had. Uh, so it was yeah. Again, I, I go back to what you were saying. It was a great defensive effort for NC State overall. Uh, but I mean they also were able to hit clutch shots. Mm-hmm. I mean you go back to the overtime period. DJ Burns now in overtime in the postseason. He's five for five <laughs> uh, with 13 points. He's hit all three of his free throw attempts. He had four rebounds uh, in that overtime period, which you needed because you had already lost Ben Middlebrooks. Mm-hmm. You had already lost uh, Mo Diara, which, you know, the fouls got a little ticky-tack there at the end, and, and you lose both those guys. But uh, you needed DJ Burns to step up. Jaden Taylor has to come in basically at the, the three with Casey Morcel moving to the four uh, with Middlebrooks and Diara both out. So you were playing small there. Uh, and Jaden Taylor steps out and hits, you know, one of his only two threes in the game. Uh, he was extremely cold, you know, up until that point. He hits a three-pointer that gives NC State separation five points, and um, you know, the rest is history from there. So, again, it's just it comes down to each and every single one of these guys stepping up as they've done this entire postseason. You know, everybody kind of put the postseason run, the the five games in five days. Everybody was like, well, you know, the last time this happened was was UConn, um, you know, and that was one spectacular player stepping up each and every single time. Well, this time around, it's been somebody new each and every single game. Ben Middlebrooks with 21 points a game before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then this game, you know, obviously DJ Burns stepping up and having the game he did. Uh, he's the first player since Lorenzo Charles back in 1985 to have an NCAA tournament game with a double-double with over 20 points. Mm-hmm. But it's just the effort all the way around, I think, for NC State. They, every single guy stepping up when it's absolutely necessary, and we'll see if they're able to do that again this week. But, Scott, your thoughts on it, man. Yeah, I think the the main thing is confidence. I think, you know, obviously DJ Horn and DJ Burns have, have done what they've done during the season. I think the last, you know, few games, DJ Burns probably didn't play as well as what he wanted to in the regular season. But once they got into uh, the conference tournament, each and every one of their role players have stepped up in some type of way. Michael Connell has been phenomenal. Diara has been phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're they're making big shots like Jaden Taylor made a big three in the overtime. Michael yeah. Connell gets the and one uh, at the end of the game yeah. uh, to, to get it to overtime. And then on, on top of it, you got the Virginia game where he banks in a, yeah. a rainbow. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's just the main thing is that guys are starting to step up in other ways. Um, I talked earlier today, you know, specifically Michael Connell. I think, you know, he's also gotten – you know, some more primary ball handling duties with Jaden mm-hmm. Taylor having a, uh, you know, an ankle issue and, and being limited. So I think he started to get some confidence, but it's flowed throughout. I mean, you know, Jaden Taylor coming off the bench and, you know, not being very warm and be able to knock down a couple threes uh, was huge. Uh, defensively, they switched and they switched with contact. Again, it's always easy to, to over pursue, especially a shooter when, you know, obviously you, you want to stay on your feet, but you also know, you know, you want to contest. So, uh, you know, I thought both sides of the ball, they did really well. Um, you know, Townsend kind of gave him some fits at times. I think, yeah. honestly, if anything, he was the one uh, that kind of kept him in the game. And then uh, Golke would just make a, a big shot when State would go on a run. So they kind of just kept it there. But, uh, you know, they, they kept their composure throughout. I think that's one of the things, too, is they, they fought through adversity during this time. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of doubt on their back, but they're just playing with a chip on their shoulder and understanding, you know, it's just those guys in the locker room truly – they're, they're the only ones that that's know, know, know what's going on. You know, everybody asks, oh, why didn't they do this at the beginning of the year? Well, nobody knows that. You know, <laughs> yeah. right. maybe, yeah. you know, maybe somebody <laughs> just had a bad week and that's why they had some bad games. It's just you never truly know, but they've come together at the right time. And I think that now they truly believe that they can beat any team in the country. Yeah. And I don't want to, you mentioned two guys that I kind of, I, I almost want to sit down and like crunch the numbers and figure out, you know, the difference in their game. But it, it you mentioned Mo Diara. Michael O'Connell, the way that they've stepped up in this postseason. Like, as much as, you know, obviously DJ Horns continue to play great. Obviously, you know, DJ Burns continue to play great. We've seen Ben Middlebrook step up at times and, and have big games. Jaden Taylor's kind of been hot and cold, but he's hit some big shots. 
I feel like the difference in this postseason has been the play of Michael O'Connell and, uh, mm. and, and Mo Diara because Mo Diara leading up to the postseason had two double-doubles all season long. He now has four in seven games in the postseason. He's the only game that he didn't have, which, you know, again, this kind of goes back to the whole Ramadan thing too. The only game that he hasn't had double-digit rebounds so far in the postseason was the Louisville game, which happened to be the only game that, that he didn't, you know, during at some point in the game there wasn't a sunset where he was able to eat and, mm -hmm. and get back out there. So we'll see how he performs in this, this upcoming game. But, you know, the two of them and then Michael O'Connell – all season long, had three games in which he had double-digit points, mm -hmm. and he's already had five out of the last seven uh, so far for NC State. Actually, no, I take that back. Six out of the seven. Uh, the only game that he hasn't had double-figure points was the game against Texas Tech. He missed all three of his shots, but still finished with uh, with six assists in that game. He had 14 assists in two games uh, in in Pittsburgh. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, not to oversimplify, but like, how much does it boost what this team is able to do? You know, as a team, the whole game, but also in crunch time when you know that you have two more reliable players that can step up for you there. Yeah, I think it's it's big. I, th I think one of the things that I said, you know, earlier in the season about this team is it's probably my, you know, I, I had no idea if they'd make the tournament or you know win any games. But I you compared them to your that 2012 team. I, that I went, thought yeah. it was the best constructed team that Kevin Keats has had, and, mm -hmm. I, and the reason why I thought that was because. One, they have a little bit more depth, but they also have multiple people that can score the basketball. It's much more balanced. And I think when DJ Horn went on his barrage and he was averaging almost, you know, 25 points a game during that yeah. spell, there just wasn't a lot of compliments there that were, were helping them. And I didn't think that that was necessarily the right, you know, you know, type of play that this NC State team needed. They needed guys that would constantly be in double figures. Now, you need – those guys that will go out there and get you 20 when you need 20, like, you know, DJ Burns and like DJ Horn. But you also got to have the compliments. And I think that's the thing mm -hmm. out of anything is they've had a little bit more balanced scoring. You know, everybody keeps asking the question, well, why aren't they double teaming DJ Burns? I think Oakland is the first team that really tried to go after him and, and, and double team over the last, you know, six games. But I think because now Michael O'Connell has confidence, DJ Horn has confidence, mm -hmm. Jaden Taylor has confidence, uh, Casey has confidence. Yeah. It's hard to double team when you know that they're playing at a high level. And I think they've just kind of, you know, looked at the game film and they said, we're just going to let them be one dimensional. If DJ Burns wants to score every time, let him score. We're going to try to limit these other guys, but the other guys are stepping up in a big way. And that's why they're hard to defend. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I actually hopped in the comment section while you and uh, uh, Brian Geisker were uh, doing your post game show and mention the fact that O'Connell and Taylor are now hitting those shots means that when DJ Burns is looking to pass out of those double teams, whoever he's tossing it out to is a threat to score. Whereas maybe before it was, you know, you were focusing so much of the defensive attention on DJ Horn. And I think Brian said uh, effectively the same side of the same coin or the different side of the same coin, which is teams do focus so much uh, defensive attention on DJ Horn when, uh, Burns is looking to pass it out. It does free up O'Connell and Taylor, and they're getting some of those wide open looks. I mean that that shot from the corner that Jaden Taylor hit uh, in overtime to put us up five. I mean there wasn't a an Oakland player <laughs> within it felt like ten yards. Yeah. Um, but you know uh, credit to him for knocking it down again on you know a hobbled ankle and and cold. I mean he's he stepped up in in a big moment and this team continues to do that. I mean Ben Middlebrooks, you know, we could we could probably spend another 5 minutes talking about the contributions he's pitched in. Um and I, was gonna, I wanted to point out a fun story because afterwards and I don't know if we actually caught it on video or anything. I'm sitting there interviewing uh DJ Burns after the first game they won and Ben Middlebrooks is in the locker room and he's doing an interview and he had he had said something on video, I guess or something to to someone recording. And he basically had said, like, I need my own stuff now. Because you got DJ Horn <laughs> and you got DJ Burns that have, you know, they, they've got their, you know, they got their NIL stuff, uh -huh. with like Breaking Tea, and there's a couple other guys that have some stuff, you know, as far as NIL deals. And he's like, he's like I need my own, you know, uh -huh. clothing line now. Uh, and, you know, shout out to Breaking Tea, who actually was trying to find out what his nickname was. Because somebody called him Benny Ballgame on the – um, on yeah. the broadcast, which is not his nickname. Yeah. Apparently, he wanted to go by. Um, ah, gosh, what is it? I have to find it now. Um, 
but they they actually came out with some new stuff today um, that is centered around him, and okay. it is oh big game Benny. Big was game what they Benny. Went with. Okay. And then also uh, there's a shirt that's in the Barbie font that is Benergy. So <laughs> uh, it's. I mean, again, like you can't like they're just having fun with it now at this point. And each and every single time NC State hits the court, it feels like breaking tea or uh-huh. some of these companies are watching to like, you know. The best part is it's thirty four dollars. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, well, and, and, and the reason why it's thirty four dollars is because they're try they give a, a large. Well, percentage I'm saying thirty four dollars because he's number. 34. Oh, well, yeah, it says yeah, it says no, yeah, yeah. There you go. Hey, I think the other one's actually. I wouldn't might have made be, any money if they made it fifteen dollars for me. Yeah. <laughs> the the good, other good one's you, actually the other ones actually are thirty dollars, and that one is thirty four. So there you go. Good advertising. Yep. It's, it's good worth the extra four dollars. Yeah, exactly. Buy your your Benergy T-shirt. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, DJ Horn wouldn't make any money. Uh, Zero dollars would be uh, a tough sell. Um, I mean, they fly off the shelf. But of course, he would. But make he does. Money. He does have a "Why Not Us" shirt that has him in the middle of it screaming, and then the uh-huh. the "Why Not Why? Us" is him is his zero. Yeah. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yes. Yeah. No. It's um. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have one with the double bird. No. <laughs> it, it is uh it yeah. is interesting i mean we saw uh you know Golke, uh goes on his tear to knock out Kent- kentucky and within hours he had a, a sponsorship deal with TurboTax. so TurboTax, uh, he was on uh, uh what it, was the there was some other ones that he was on i think um yeah he was on like the pardon my take and all this different stuff too so yeah i mean so we live in an era now where where athletes can uh within you know hours capitalize on on big moments and and that's what's so great about March. Uh, hey, the energy shirt for nice. anybody that's curious. Nice. So Greg Sankey, don't <laughs> don't get it twisted and think that we need to add more teams to the tournament or or keep out more of these mid majors. The mid majors are what uh, make it such a great event. Yes. Um, uh, gosh, I felt like I had a point. Oh, someone uh, in the comments mentioned that uh, they felt like Scott could uh, shoot Golki under the table. Uh, I'm I'm curious, Brings Scott. You back to your initial question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like. Wh- how in in the pantheon of great shooters that you've seen? I think you you actually were um, on the same roster with Steph for a bit, or no, Clay Thompson was and, it at Golden State? Yeah, yeah. So you you've been around great shooters. You've seen you know uh, plenty of great shooters and and are one yourself. So uh, how how does a guy like Golke, um stack up against some of the greats that you've seen? Well, I would say that the nice part is when he's on the court they're basically running all their action through right. him. So he's almost hunting a shot every single time. So right. with that confidence that you have the ultimate green light yeah. for anybody, you're, you're going to make a lot. Have you ever seen a shot chart like his? Uh, <laughs> I think he'd only uh, taken eight two-pointers uh, uh, this season. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, and that's, that's – we, we, were, we were laughing because he tried to bring the ball up a few times, uh, and he could not get the ball at the court with Casey. I was like, just let him bring it up and just pressure him because he did not want to. He looked very uncomfortable uh, yeah. <laughs> putting the ball on the floor. But especially in that first game, they just run so much action, whether he's coming off stagger screens. They do a good job of setting cross screens for Townsend, and you can't help. Uh, yeah. So that's how Townsend probably gets a lot of really easy looks because he's setting that cross screen to a quick pin down. So they just have so much action that he's literally hunting it. And when you have that green light, the, the confidence is through the roof. Yeah, I didn't see quite as much against NC State as you saw against Kentucky. It felt like, I mean, he was weaving in and out of players, like trying to trying so hard to get him open in that one. Whereas it felt like this one, they, they kind of had gotten to the point where they're like, all right, we can win inside some as well. I mean, did it feel a little bit different in this game compared to the Kentucky, the Kentucky game? Well, I also think that, you know, NC State watched the game film and they realized that yeah. that's probably yeah. the reason they <laughs> Kentucky lost. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> staying home. But I also think they just did a good job of staying connected to his body. Uh, they did a good job switching when they had to switch. Uh, everybody kind of took away his airspace. Uh, you know, even when he did get a catch and got a shot off, he would have to, you know, pump fake one dribble, which is going to make a shooter uncomfortable. They just, especially him, he just wants to catch yeah. and shoot it. Uh, but overall, I mean, if you're going to make, you know, somebody take 17 shots and 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 only make six, I mean, sometimes you just got to live with that, especially you know, someone that shoots at that high of a level. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you too. I mean, the difference between playing in that first round compared to the Sweet 16, because you know. You, you were on a team, obviously, you guys got through the first two uh, rounds and got onto the Sweet 16. You went to St. Louis. I mean, what was, what was the difference, you know, between that week to, you know, obviously the competition level steps up a little bit because you're playing a higher seed. But, 
you know, how different was that stage compared to, you know, the first two rounds? Yeah, so Joe asked that question uh, earlier today, and, and the way I, I kind of looked at it was, you know, the, the first, you know, round, you're, you're just out there having fun. Like, you just want to try to be there. Yeah, right? yeah. You just want to try to <laughs> advance. You're, you know, you're enjoying the moment. And then all of a sudden you get to the Sweet 16, and it's like, wait, you're telling me if we win two games, we're in the Final Four? Yeah. Like, yeah. you start to realize that, you know, there's only – so many more opportunities you know you got to make the most of it you know I, I look back on that kansas game and you know we had them on the ropes for for most of the game and you know made a couple mistakes towards the end and, and let the game kind of slip away to get to give kansas win but i think it's the the first time where you know outside of them being in the tournament which i think is honestly beneficial for them that you know when you got to virginia it's like oh crap we win one more game and we, you're telling me we got a chance to win a, yeah. a championship yeah so i think honestly that's going to be the nice part they've kind of gone through it and i think it's going to be an eye opener when they look at it, it's like okay we get marquette got to win against marquette you could all of a sudden play against duke who you've manhandled and you've played really well throughout the season but you may get houston but again two wins and it gives you a chance to be in the final four I do feel like with this team, too, you mentioned the confidence. It feels like this team has confidence in late game situations, too, where it's like, hey, you know, regardless of what happens leading up to it, as long as we keep it close, we feel like we can either create separation or we can get this game to a point where we can pull away at some point. I mean, how, how much different is that compared to what we saw from the – obviously, you're not in the locker room. You're not seeing – you know, hearing what these guys are saying, but – you know, seeing it on the court, how different does it feel for, for these guys compared to where it was, you know, the, where they're playing a lot of catch up, they're playing and, and trying to get back um, in late game situations in the regular season. Yeah, I, I think even, you know, the Syracuse game where they give up 55 points in the first half, they've, yeah. they've come back. They didn't end up winning the game, but they've come back in a lot of games. But I think, you know, especially as a player, you look back on those moments throughout the season, and it's like, okay, we've we've done this. We've, we've been able to kind of crawl back in it. So just being able to battle through adversity, you know, teams, basketball is a game of runs. Someone's going to go on an 8-0 run. Some teams are going to go on a 7-0 run. So whoever has the most runs is typically going to win the game. So I think one of the things that they have been good at is, you know, eliminating the long droughts uh, mm -hmm. of scoring, which they've been, you know, prone to. So they just kind of sit there and battle. You know, you're going to take a couple punches in a basketball game, but you got to get back up and dish a couple more out. Have you ever seen uh, a phenomenon quite like when DJ Burns gets the the ball in the post? Like, I, you know, no, he didn't. He didn't have it in the last game. No, nope. of course not. No, he didn't. He, the, <laughs> everyone was cheering for Oakland in yeah. that game. But like in the prior game against Texas oh, yeah. Tech, I mean, he'll get it moving forward too. Yeah, because they'll be the highest seed. They're the only double digit seed left. It was almost like a uh, uh, like a call and response thing, like that one sequence where Mike O'Connell and, and Burns were just they kept resetting the post. Like you know, he get it in deep. Cloud would, the crowd would cheer. He'd kick it out the mic. The crowd would dissipate, <laughs> and nothing. then <laughs> and then back to DJ. Crowd gets excited. I'm I'm hard pressed to think of a another situation, at least for NC State, where a player has been so beloved by not just their own fan base, but like just the excitement of seeing this guy go to work. It's mm -hmm. crazy. Well, the uh, when um, after the ACC championship, uh, Sonny uh, Levi's son plays on our AAU organization, yep. and we had a game in Richmond the following day, and so he was there. And and one of the things that Levi was talking about was. You know, it's fun that now we've been seeing it this whole time. Sure. You know, what kind of personality he is, what type of person he is, how good of a, you know, offensively gifted basketball player he is. And now the whole world is seeing it. So yeah. I think just because of his personality and how he is, I mean, he's just – he's always smiling. He's having a good time. Uh, has now, you know, caught on to the rest of the world. I mean, I can't get on social media and – but whether it's Barstool or dang right. CNN, there's something <laughs> DJ Burns somewhere. So I just think now all of a sudden the the whole world, quite frankly, has has seen him and watched him play. And, you know, they just look at him as, you know, the big fella down low that every time he touches it, whether it's a 7-1 guy guard him or just a pure athlete, he's able to manhandle anybody down there on the block. Yeah. I, I do think it's his rare combination of just incredible strength that, I, you know, I don't want to immediately go to his size, but like he he's able to, you know, uh, reposition defensive players who would otherwise, you know, like the way he handled uh, Armando Baycott in the ACC title game, as though Armando was not, you know, 
uh, the I think the ACC def- one of the defensive uh, players of the like on the all ACC all defensive player yeah yeah, yeah I yeah. mean just incredible um, and uh, the fact that he has just incredible shooting touch it, it you you see him spin and cut and the footwork like the whole package is just so much fun to watch and you're right I, I'm I'm excited that NC State is alive if for no other reason just the fact that he's going to be a fun storyline for a lot of folks who don't follow the ACC and don't follow NC State to um, to connect with. To be fair, a lot of national ma- uh, national media don't follow the ACC very good. So. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, clearly. that's another topic. That's a, yeah. yeah, We'll get into that in just a second. The one thing I wanted to point out, too, was with DJ Burns, uh, one of the one of the uh, so back to what you were saying as far as the the weight thing. Obviously, there was a bunch of people that were kind of grilling him in between the games just to, because they're fi- kind of finding out about him. Uh, there's a couple of people there that you know from national media and stuff like that. They were trying to put stories out on him. And one of the things they asked him was like, "What what do you think makes you a fan favorite?" And he was like, "Yeah, I mean, I guess some of it's probably my weight. Um, it's probably just the you know the the way that I look." Um, he's like, "You know, when when people look at me, they see more of." maybe themselves, like, you know, a guy that, that shouldn't be out there uh, on the court and competing at this high of a level, but I'm able to, so it gives them maybe a little bit of hope that they could do it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, you know, and also he said uh, that I think the big thing for him was we were asking him about, you know, just kind of embracing the, the fan support that he was getting. And he's like, yeah, he's like, it kind of made me nervous at first. I didn't want to fully embrace it because – in the NCAA tournaments he's been in in the past, he was with, in one with Winthrop, and then last year mm-hmm. he hasn't performed particularly well. Last year against Creighton, one for six, finished with two points, and then I was going back uh, with Winthrop. He went against Villanova, which Villanova is Villanova, right. uh, but he was only able to play 19 minutes in that game because he fouled out. He had 12 points, but his team lost by 10 because of the fact that he just wasn't able to be out there, um, even though he was the you know the conference player of the year that year. So... I think this was more of a confidence thing for him of like, all right, I can do this and I can be that player on this stage as well. Um, and, and now you're seeing and he's, he's shining. I mean, again, he, he had two double-doubles the entire season. Uh, and he had, he's had, uh, he had the biggest one um, on that stage uh, against a team you know, in Oakland that, that you know, was undersized. But he was able to get four rebounds in, in the overtime period to be able to push them forward. So. Yeah, I think that his conclusion to last season was kind of disappointing, whereas this year he's playing his best basketball. Yeah, I mean, uh, even even in the ACC tournament, I mean, the game against Clemson, he was very frustrated, you know, getting defended by Ben Brooks in yeah. that game. So yeah. it's nice to have him on the other side, right? Yeah, that trade worked out pretty nice. Uh, yeah. State got a good player in Ben Middlebrooks, and Jack Clark uh, is on to the Sweet 16. So That'll work. Um, you know, worked out for both parties. Uh, it was pretty well. Um, you know, I... I uh, I don't want to move on unless we're ready, but I mean, like, you know, do we want to talk about what to expect in Marquette? I mean, I don't know how how much either one of you guys have looked ahead to what we will face. I mean, we know it's a shock of smart team, so they're going to be aggressive, forcing turnovers. Uh, you know, it's they're going to play with high energy. Uh, I do think that the, the narr- we can put to bed at this point the narrative of how many games they've played in how much span of time. There's been enough days of rest One now, right? One would think. One would think. Yeah. But, man, the, uh, the Oakland media or the Michigan media was, was having a lot of fun with that. Like, hey, you guys, this will be your seventh game in 12 days. Yes, guys, we've, we've all <laughs> talked about this. Can you allow us to ask questions and, uh, and move forward with that? That would be wonderful. So. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's an interesting storyline when you look at it in aggregate as far as the number of games and days. But, like, they had a significant chunk of rest between the ACC tournament and the two games they played. Um, and when you get a day of rest in between, you know, the Thursday and Saturday game, I, you know, at this point, everybody's – pretty much, you know, rested up. I know Keith said, I think going into the game that everybody's dealing with nagging injuries, obviously Jaden's issue with his ankle um, and, and other uh, health issues, but the, the, the playing field's pretty level as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I think uh, obviously State has a, a – I mean, how do you bet against NC State at this point, right? I mean, you know, the, the yeah. numbers should suggest that Marquette is the, the favorite, and they will be. I think they're a five- or six-point favorite, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. But, I mean – Five and a half, I believe, right now. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you know, you're facing the team that you beat in 74 to win the title with a chance to potentially face the team you beat in 83 that's, to win the title. That's exactly what Ken said here. He's like, right. you know, the, the way the bracket kind of squares up for NC State. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's I think it's very interesting in that sense. But at the same time, this Marquette team is is 
who they are because of how well they perform. Cam Jones has been ridiculously good for them throughout the season. But then um, another guy to know, Tyler Kolick, uh, that, I mean, you know, averages almost eight assists per game. I believe he had 11 uh, in the last game. So he's a, a great ball distributor for them, but also a guy that scores really well, um, you know, averages over 15 points per game. So, you know, they're, they're, they're running into a team that is exactly what you just described, but a team that's been able to do that all season long. With four guys that average over 10 points per game, you've got a guy uh, in Kolick that you know is is the point man for that entire offense. Um, I mean, we're talking about you know Michael O'Connell having a great game, having eight assists. That's what Kolick averages. Uh, so like that's that's kind of what you're running up against as a team that that does move the ball extremely well. You're going to have to play um, really strong defense against them, and then. As you mentioned, with, with Shaka Smart, his defensive style, that, that havoc defense, mm -hmm. um, and trying to keep somebody in front of you to not allow you to drive, it's going to force NC State to try to take some shots. It's going to force NC State to you know, try to get going with DJ Burns. But you know this team does have some size. They've got some, some big men down low that can try to stop him. So I'll be interested to see this entire matchup. I mean, I don't know, Scott, if you've had a chance to look at them and, and figure this out. Uh, I haven't watched Marquette too much. I do know that you know the strength of Marquette and the strength of NC State defensively is going to be the guard play. I think, you know, Casey yeah. Marcel, Jaden Taylor, Michael O'Connell, uh, you have phenomenal guards that guard on ball very well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone like Kolick is, you know, that creates and does so much, there's going to be good perimeter defense on him pretty much the whole night. So that that's one thing that, you know, they're going to have to do a good job. They're not going to have over help. You know, I'd almost live with them. If he's going to f have, finish with a handover, you just got to live with some pull-ups and you try not to let him get all the way to the rim. Uh, but, again, I think it comes down to, you know, the DJ Burns matchup. Every single time mm -hmm. I, I look at it, it's like, okay, who's who's DJ Garden? I thought it was a good fit. I don't know his name, number two, who's, you know, made one three, and I think he made two threes going into the game all year. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. uh, was a good matchup for DJ. Yeah. Yeah. He, he doesn't have to do a whole lot. He can kind of, you know, relax at times. Are they going to make DJ guard? And if I was a coach on another team, I would make him guard. I'd put him in pick and roll situations so that he has to move. I think the nice part is Modiara has covered up mm. a lot of that over the last few games. But at the same time, you know, in the famous words of Mark Godfrey, you got to guard us too, pal. Yep. So somebody, <laughs> somebody's got to guard DJ Burns too. I'm yeah, I think I think the guy on that's going to be. Uh, I've got him pulled up here, Oso Gadara, mm -hmm. um, a guy who is six eleven, granted, but two thirty five. So, 235? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm not going to give away any secrets here, but everybody keeps <laughs> listing uh, DJ Burns at 275 and keeps talking about he's 275. He's not, um, <laughs> just so we're clear. So he's, he's going to have some, some weight on the guy, I mean, quite yeah. a bit. So uh, being able to body into him, granted, he's going to be two inches sw smaller, but uh, we know his shot. Uh, we know it's – I mean, he's able to put it over big defenders as well. Um, I mean, the, the back God, the left side of the glass was just money for him in the last game against uh, against Oakland. So I'll be interested to see how he you know, how they try to defend him, because, again, while you might have some size, you're probably gonna have to try to double him and, and force NC State to find open shooters. Uh, the only team that's been able to do it really recently was UVA uh, and they've done it twice. But both those times were at their home court. So they had a little bit of home cooking, too. I'm remembering in last year's game against Creighton, uh, mm -hmm. Kalkbrenner was on that roster, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Right, I think DJ did struggle a little bit with Kalkbrenner just because he, you know, he's a big guy, but more importantly, he had size, like height and you know reach. And so DJ certainly doesn't struggle backing anyone down who you know uh, weighs however many uh, pounds slighter than he. But if I'll say ninety. Yeah, but if it's someone who has the ability to stick a hand up uh, and have a, you know a couple inches over them, that might be a, a little bit of an issue and something uh, to to keep an eye on. But I mean, he's playing such great ball at this point in time. Um, I am curious, both of you guys, what your thoughts are on if NC State. Uh, we know that they love to get out and get points in transition and create points off of turnovers. And but would that play into Marquette's hands? Should they try to? Uh, Maybe control the tempo a little bit in this game and keep DJ a little DJ a little fresher, perhaps. Not you know you don't want to wear him out in a track meet necessarily. Uh, we do know that Mo and, and Ben have been he able. Played, he played forty two minutes in the yeah. forty five minute game the last game. So yeah, he, he's he's definitely uh, <laughs> he looks really fresh in overtime somehow right. or another. I will say you know 
watch NC State unless I'm just missing. I don't think they've been pressuring as much as they have. I haven't seen as much of the two-two-one zone that they typically run. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, they, they'll get up full court and just turn, not necessarily to trap or do anything else. But I also think a lot of that's been because they've been playing with a little bit of lead, uh, mm, right. so they don't have to necessarily do as much as that. So honestly, I think they're they're probably going to do the same. Every once in a while, they'll they'll pick up just to make you uncomfortable, uh, you know, make your offense start a little bit further out than what it usually does. But I think that's also another way that you can protect DJ a little bit is that he's not back there on an island when a team breaks a press like Kolick, who can handle the basketball and 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 make the right plays. Uh, so I think they've protected him a lot that way too. Is is not pressuring as much and leaving him back there on the island. I was also going to say, I think part of that, too, is because of the fact that they've cut down a little bit on the, the rotations or the guys that they put in there, too. I mean, obviously, you know, having LJ Thomas leave the team, you know, not having MJ Rice available. And then, uh, you know, at this point, they haven't had DPJ available. We'll find out if he's he's available for this one. They could probably use him, particularly in that first game, uh, if they're going to try to advance against Marquette because of the fact that if you do have a a slightly fatigued Bo Diara, you'd love to at least have somebody at the, you know, as a, as a big option to be able to put at that three, four spot uh, with Dennis Parker Jr. We'll see if he's available. Um, but I, I did want to mention too, and I don't know, I was listening to this interview you did with Julio uh, today. It may have been there or it may have been on uh, another show, but I think the fact that NC state has gotten out to early leads has helped. They've been able to play in front and not chase as much. Um, it, it, it's a different dynamic when you, you know, are able to kind of assert yourself early in a game and play, you know, with uh, that confidence. You know, the, you know, the, they're obviously they're an extremely confident, confident bunch already. But you know, when it manifests itself in an early lead, even if the team that you're facing comes back and gets it close or ties it, I mean, I would wager that they've probably led what eighty percent, ninety percent of the minutes that they've played so far in this postseason. I think the only time they trailed at halftime has been the U- the UNC game, and that was because they hit that right. last second three pointer. Yeah, they only trailed for a handful of minutes in that UNC game. So a minute and four seconds. Yeah, so it was either um, tied or or leading for the other thirty eight. Yeah. 50, whatever it is. It means you're not feeling the pressure to, you know, jack up a three to get back into it or, um, or, or, or feel pressured to, you know, score in bunches. Um, uh, you know, it, it uh, those things kind of compound themselves when you're struggling to score, then you're kind of forcing things a little bit. And then that just makes you less likely to break those scoring droughts. We, like you said, Scott, we haven't seen those scoring droughts like we've seen at earlier points in this season. So, um, uh, I didn't know if you were throwing it over to him or not. So. I, I honestly don't know where I was going to go with this. Uh, I'm a bad point guard. <laughs> You're just kind of uh, talking at that point. Yeah, now. they're playing you. with the lead. Good <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good there, you go, there you go. He's playing like, yeah, in the lead. Good thing. That sounds Always about right. Always stay up four. Always stay up <laughs> yes. four. You well, can win the game staying yes. up four. Exactly. Let me – okay. Hashtag analysis. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a chance to talk about this because I know, you know, listening to, listening to you and Joe this morning, um, and I didn't realize you were going to be on this podcast when I asked you to come on, so – uh, I do appreciate you jumping on and doing two podcasts in one day. But <laughs> I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a stage to kind of give your thoughts on on the fact that the, the ACC didn't have more than five teams. Because, you know, while I do think, you know, the, the target has moved a little bit, if I'm going back and looking at it, if I'm, if I'm asking, like, realistic options for who else should have gotten in, I would, I mean, I would really say Pittsburgh should have been in. But I understand the fact that, you know, they started off 1-5 and five in conference. I get that, but and they didn't have any great non-conference wins. But the way they finished the season, if we're going back to the old eye test, you know, the last 10 games of the eye test, they should have been a team that should have been in. Whereas Wake Forest was a team that had the bigger wins, but then, you know, that quite, I mean, for lack of a better term, they sucked down the stretch. Like, they lost some stupid games they shouldn't have lost. Georgia Tech in particular being one of them at home. You can't lose that game and then and then be comfortable going into the ACC tournament. But do you feel like there were other teams that deserved to be in um, in the ACC tournament and uh, you know over some some SEC or some uh, Big 12 or Big 10 teams? It's a tough question because <laughs> I, I think it's easy to look at it now and say, well, there's four teams in the Sweet 16 from the yeah. ACC. That's a dominant conference. Idiots, like, yeah. I mean, what are y'all <laughs> right. doing? Right. But I would also say I would think the selection committee got it right. Um, but with that being said, it, it's very easy to probably take 10 teams 
if given the opportunity, could, you know, win two games in the tournament. Mm -hmm. But that's just also how it is. What is it, 68 now? Yeah. So 68 teams get in, and, you know, some of it's a little bit of luck. Some of it's who you beat and how they did towards the end of the season that helps your net. Uh, but I do think, you know, they, they got the right teams in. Um, now, with that being said, you know, a kind of a, a different topic, which we talked about earlier this morning, was, you know, why is, you know, the national media over the last few months just absolutely bash the ACC on how bad a play, you right. know, th th there's not any good teams. There's no one that can go to the Sweet 16. Duke's soft, you know. Carolina's going to fold when the time comes. One of your, your former coaches, Bobby Lutz, calling out John yeah. Rothstein for his <laughs> nonsense. And I think that's just – if anything that I've learned is – Every single year, that's all I hear. And I think my disgust isn't necessarily, you know, you could blame the NCAA and we've gone down the list. You know, you can blame the ACC and their PR, which is something we talked about earlier yeah, today. Yeah. It, it's just, it's the Big Ten and SEC. Everybody is looking at them because, oh, they're, they're turning into the two power conferences. They're supposedly, you know, got the best teams. Right. But at the end of the day, ACC is a basketball conference. They always perform towards the end of the year. Year after year, I see them saying, oh, look, Miami's in the Final Four. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, you know, somebody else is in the Final Four. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that there's really good coaching in the ACC. You know, I watch Grand Canyon. I watch uh, Houston last night. I watched Alabama, uh, and I watched Texas A&M. And, listen, we can all be critical of Kevin Keats's offensive scheme and what he does or does not do. You can't sit there and look at those four teams and tell me that Kevin Keats doesn't run more off. They just run yep. up and down. Like we, me and my dad, who's here, we talked <laughs> yep. about it the other day. It looks yep. like they were on the blacktop. Just get the rebound and run as fast as you can and try and score. Yep. You know that, but that's also what basketball's slowly turning into. Mm -hmm. So, I just think you know these ACC teams. When the time comes, they're not only defending at a high level but they're executing on the offensive end. It's not just the roll the ball out. You know, even just giving the ball and getting a post touch and a trap and then move the ball or cutting is something that I didn't see one time in Grand Canyon game or, yeah, or I heard Houston that. game. So I just think you're starting to see basketball IQ win, and that's why I think, you know, a lot of these teams and even Purdue's going to probably have a better chance because of good coaching and they play the game a certain way. I think UConn's the same way. UConn isn't just – turning it into a track meet, they're good enough to. Mm -hmm. But they also can play different styles. They can play different paces and still win basketball games. And that's what I think everybody's seeing out of the ACC right now. And I'll point out one other thing. It's exactly what we talked about last week was the way that NC State was able to beat UNC is by saying we're not going to let them get out in the open court. Right. Exactly what you were just talking about. A lot of these teams are just, Exactly. They're like, all right, well, we got to figure out this team in, in three, four days, and sometimes, you know, turn around in 48 hours or less, and, and you're not able to figure out what style of play this team is really about or how to stop them. For NC State, they knew, all right, UNC is going to try to get on the open court. We're not even going to care about offensive rebounds. They had two offensive rebounds the entire game because they said, we're not going to let you – you know, get out in the open court and try to beat us that way. We're going to force you to get into your half court sets, and UNC shot the ball 27% in the second half. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what teams have done to NC State all year, is saying we're not going to allow you. We're, if, they're, if they can limit their turnovers and if they can not allow NC State to get out in the open court, you can probably beat NC State because the half court offense has not been great at times. Now, where it stepped up is the fact that Mo Diar has been better, Ben Middlebrooks has been better. Uh, Michael O'Connell's been better, so you have more scoring options and you have more guys that you can run sets through as opposed to saying, all right, got to finish with DJ Horn or DJ Burns each and every single time and sometimes Jaden Taylor. So it just feels like that's, that's where you're seeing teams step up from being good or great teams that can win in March to being elite teams. And we'll see if NC State's able to keep that, that run up. So. Yeah, uh, to your point, Scott, about the committee getting it right. I mean, the, I think the fact that you know uh, everyone but NC State that advanced is effectively a higher seed, you know, means that you know, as as much as we might have nitpicked some of the choices in the seeding, you know, they they ultimately got it pretty right. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of why teams from the SEC and, and Big Ten have struggled, I heard one person make the argument that you know. NIL has changed the game in a lot of ways, and it's allowed teams uh, and coaches to build rosters very quickly. 
uh, in a way where you know they're not ha they're not facing um, uh, a variety of different types of teams. Like in the ACC, you're playing against a team like a Virginia, where you have to really execute well in the half court, and you also are facing teams where you you know have to win a track meet. <clears throat> you know, a team like Kentucky, a team like Auburn. They're getting supremely athletic guys who are just crushing teams by, you know, sprinting up and down the court. But when you force them to play in the half court, they're not as skilled in that skill set. And, you know, a team like Kentucky that's young, you know, Cal trying to do it the uh, the old fashioned way of recruiting, you know, a tremendous amount of, you know, elite 18, 19 year old kids. They're going against teams that are much older than them. Oakland. I mean, Golke looked like he was <laughs> 35 years old. Yeah. Uh, appearances are obviously not, uh, you know, don't line up exactly with his birth certificate. But, you know, they they faced a team that was older, more experienced, more composed. And, you know, they did not, uh, you know, they were certainly the more athletic team Kentucky was, but um, they, they were not able to respond uh, as well. So um, I, I think it's just a, a continued evolution of the sport and, and hopefully, Scott, we're not going to see more and more of the de-evolution, the devolution of uh, the sport. Um, but uh, I do think that there's a lot to be committed on this NC State coaching staff for the way that they've been able to game plan, particularly down the stretch here. All right, I'm looking at the clock. We're nearing in on an hour. We haven't even talked women's basketball. The fact that they have uh, advanced to the Sweet 16 as well. Uh, big win tonight. <coughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> A lot of the folks here in attendance actually were at the women's game tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, welcome to home, uh, or not home uh, per se, but welcome back, let me say, Kelly Harper, uh, coaching her alma mater in the Tennessee Volunteers, Lady Volunteers. Um, and uh, they, uh, boy, they got up big and then had, had to hang on for a squeaker there at the end. Um, but, you know, this team, uh, much in the same way that we've, uh, we're have just talking about with the men's side, are just finding ways to win. Uh, it's it's sometimes not pretty, but uh, you know they made big plays when they needed to. Um, what can we say about the performance of the women's team as both uh, the men's and the women's team advanced into the Sweet 16? Yeah, I mean, again, a lot of it was the fact that you have scorers up and down the court. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, Isaiah James and and Saniya Rivers both stepping up in a big way tonight. Both of them having 20 plus points. But then those four players. I mean, Zoe Brooks. Uh, in uh, in a big game for her, her first, or, you know, not her first NCAA tournament game, but first, you know, against great competition. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll just put it that way. Uh, and and she steps up in a big way with 16 points tonight, uh, and you know, getting the ball up and down the court uh, really well for NC State too. So you, what you're looking for is is a team that again you can't just kind of pinpoint who you're going to stop. And this team is actually despite what they did in the first quarter, is actually a very good defensive team. Uh, they, they allowed Rakia Jackson to go for 14 points in the first quarter, and that led to uh, South Carolina getting 23 in the first quarter alone. Uh, but then they, they went on a 25-8 to eight run in the second quarter uh, to close things down and, and you know go into the half with, I believe it was a 16- or 18-point lead, if I remember correctly. Like 16 so, sounds right. Yeah, yeah so you know that's, that's what we've seen from this team all year is – when they're able to turn it on, it's hard for other teams to be able to, to stop them. But at the same time, in order for your offense to work, I mean, in order for your defense to work, your offense has to be working and, you know, vice versa too. They were able to get some turnovers, getting to the open court uh, and be able to pull away. And then, you know, on the, on the offensive end, when they got into their offensive sets, they were able to hit big shots. So uh, this team has looked, you know, looked about as complete as any NC State team as we've seen in a while. Um, all throughout the season, and I think, you know, what we saw in the first three, you know, the three games in the ACC tournament, uh, the threes were not falling for them for whatever reason, but outside of that, everything else was still a well-oiled machine in those three games. I think you're seeing that team kind of come back a little bit over these last two games. We'll see if they're able to do it against Stanford and Cameron Brink and, and everybody else they have on that, that roster uh, this upcoming week when they go um, to Portland on Friday. Yes. They will not be going to the Nike outlet, as we found out. So there is that. <laughs> yes, some funny post-game yeah. comments uh, uh, where the student athletes had to be reminded uh, which apparel uh, manufacturer uh, closed <laughs> their university. Um, uh, yeah, did, I don't, Most of them did play on the EYBL circuit, so there's, <laughs> there's that, yeah. I, you know, uh, I think 
you know, I think probably a lot of state fans were rooting for Stanford to fall uh, in overtime against Iowa State, um, you know, much in the same way that we rooted for Kentucky to lose against Oakland. Um, Iowa State's pretty freaking good, too. So, I mean, either one of those teams are going to be a tough matchup. Yeah. Right, right. Um, they had a freshman go off for 40 points on 90% shooting in the first game. So. Yeah. So it's not exactly being shipped off to uh, Con- Connecticut to face off the uh, against the UConn Huskies, <laughs> but heading to Portland uh, on the West Coast uh, against Stanford. I mean, should should they expect to face a, a hostile environment when they get there? Most out. Yeah, I mean, flights there are over seven hundred dollars. So um, that's just that's just the flight alone. So I, you know, as much as NC State fans travel, it's going to be a little bit tough to, right. to go all the way to Portland. Uh, you know, midweek or, you know, even at the end of the week on a Friday to, to try to um, go out there. So we'll see. I mean, but, yeah, this is a – it's going to be a very, uh, you know, Stanford-friendly crowd. Um, all of them are able to basically drive up and, and go see their team. And, again, Cameron Brink, one of the better players in the country. She's a um, p- probably a top five, if not top three overall pick in the WNBA draft. Uh, coming up soon, so uh, they're going to have their hands full. And and you know the good thing for NC State is the way River Baldwin's played, uh, and you know Cameron Brink just fouled out in the last game they had. So uh, <laughs> we know we know how good uh, River is at being able to draw charges. So uh, hopefully that kind of you know helps helps them a little bit in this game too. Yeah, I saw a clip. Uh, she had a, uh, a couple of choice words for the official uh, as she was heading to the bench. It looked like she said, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think it yes. It was definitely not, it definitely didn't start with a... F- thank, so. thank you. Yes, thank, yes. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, so, so big news, I, I you know... Uh, that was also a shooting foul, by the way, and she should have gotten two shots, but I'm just, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we shall uh, see how both teams fare. It's an exciting time. Uh, I, 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 I've... I don't know if Scott, your experience, Corey, yours with friends and family reaching out over the last couple of weeks about via text or messaging uh, through various apps. But I, I've I've heard um, messages of excitement and jubilation from a lot of people, um, and I'm hopeful that everyone in Wolfpack Nation is is enjoying this because it's it's a lot of fun and. Uh, you know, I, Scott, have you? Have You've you, got nicer friends than I do because everybody, <laughs> everybody texts me and said you guys got lucky that ball was off Oakland. <laughs> so I mean, you've got different friends than it I do. It was not off Oakland. He still had the ball in his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, well, I wanted, you, yeah. I wanted to ask you to. Uh, this goes back to the ACC championship because I, I wanted to have you on last week, and you know, uh, we had something come up, and, and you weren't able to come on. But I wanted to ask you about that. That moment of, and I'm sorry to, to skip away from women's basketball again, but that moment of seeing, you know, the confetti fall for NC State, being there courtside and being able to watch that that moment last week because it's something that, you know, a lot of people in their entire lifetimes haven't been able to see. And obviously, you grew up in Indiana. I know your, your state fandom started when you started getting recruited by them. But, you know, what was that moment like to, to see it finally happen for NC State? Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, I, like I said, we had an AAU tournament in, in Richmond, so it worked out almost perfectly for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We we played at two and four, and then I just hopped in the car and and, and drove to DC. Nice. Uh, and and was lucky enough to, to to have a hotel, which was where the team stayed. But you know, just being able to watch, I, I'm I'm usually pretty reserved. Uh, even when I played, you didn't see a lot of emotion out of me. The first half, I kind of just sat there, and then the second half. Uh, me and Dwayne Washington were sitting uh, next to each other. We were <laughs> nice. going bonkers. Like yeah. it was just like, uh. Uh, but you know, it was it was just so much fun. You know, I can't help but think, you know, Levi Watkins, who who comes back and, and was a former player, being on yeah. staff and w- what it must have meant uh, for him. Uh, you know, being a guy that had, had made it to a, a championship and then all of a sudden JJ Reddick goes bonkers. Yeah. Uh, mm. You know, I had so many fans come up to me and tell me congratulations, but in all reality, I mean, you know this fan base has been dying for you know an ACC championship and in a year where you know I've, I've been on a podcast and said 90 percent of the fan base was checked out on Kevin Keats and they yeah. you know keep a chip on their shoulder their backs against the wall they come together as a group and go win it when yeah probably 90 percent of the fan base didn't think there was any chance they thought mm-hmm. they'd probably right. lose to Louisville and be done but I think Just, D, I think DJ Burns's comments uh, he said the, welcome yeah, back. <laughs> yeah, uh, for, yeah. For those that have been riding with us, we appreciate it, and, and for everybody else, welcome back. Yeah. So you know, just being there, you know, being able to see, you know, guys like Greg Hatem, you know, Wendell Murphy, 
Uh, a lot of big time donors that have just stuck by Wolfpack Nation side, paying our scholarships that have paved the way for us uh, and be able to hoist a trophy. You know, I, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I wish I would have had an opportunity to do. It's also a very hard thing to do. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. It is not easy. It takes a lot of luck and it takes, you know, a lot of preparation and some things got to go your way. And uh, for them to just come together as a group when they very easily could have packed, you know, one pair of underwear, one shirt, and, and, and <laughs> one pair of socks, and just said, you know what, let's mail it in, boys. It's, it's all done. For them to come together and, and do what they're doing now is, is, has been a lot of fun. And I'll, I'll have a, a story on this uh, later this week. I'm still trying to sit down and find the time. I have a, a long, a lengthy honeydew list uh, since I got home on Sunday. Uh, but the, the interactions that I had with DJ Burns, with Casey Morsell, um, and with some other guys as well about – and I just kind of asked them after the game on Saturday. I said, what does this mean to do this for Kevin Keats as well? Like, what is yeah. – because obviously, you know, as much as you guys try to block it out, I'm sure you saw everything. I mean, this was Saturday night. Two weeks prior, they had lost their fourth straight game against Pittsburgh on the road, and we're going to have to play three days later uh, as a 10 seed against the number 15 seed in which everybody was saying, all right, once this game is over, if NC State loses, you know, we're moving on and, and we're going to the next great thing. We're going to try to find somebody. They've gone on a run now, seven straight games, and the interactions that I got with them were, you know, DJ Burns essentially saying, like, we wanted to do this for him. We, mm -hmm. we wanted to because he believed in us. We believed in him. We wanted to go on this run. We wanted to do these things for him. And Casey Morsell saying the same thing. I mean, you go back to the Clemson game. Like, the moment they kind of realized – all right, we've got a big enough win to be able to help us get to the NCAA tournament, and then things went south after that. But you remember back to, to Casey Morsell lifting him up um, on the sidelines and, and grabbing him and carrying him. Like, this team loves, loves Kevin Keats. Yeah. Like, they want to see him be successful. They want to see this program be successful. They don't want to be the reason why he was, you know, having to find a job after this offseason. So – um, it's just been an incredible to watch what they've been able to accomplish and and where they've been able to go. Um, so I, we'll we'll see, um, you know, what they're able to do once they get to Dallas this upcoming week. But the you know, again, seven games uh, straight to get to the point where they're at right now. First Sweet 16 since 2015. Obviously, Mark Godfrey took them on two, and and this guy was a part of one of them. But um, you know, just the the way that they've been able to kind of string this along has been has been insane. Yeah, I, I don't think at any point, you know, let's say that, you know, because State was trailing, I think, at half against Louisville, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in that first game. Let's say that game ends with a loss. You know, I, I think that – I don't think it's, um, you know, definitive, but uh, it would have been easy to see that being the end of the, the Keats tenure. But I don't think at any point during, you know, the the season up to that and then in the years that he's been here have we not seen this team you know fight like they they have the ability to fight back in just about every game they get down big they find a way to cut it to single digits or even tie it um i feel like i've had so many times where i've been in the the you know bonus room watching these games being like just get over the hump just you know you, you fought so hard to get back you've dug yourself this hole now you've gotten back you know the there's teams that we have seen in this league previously uh coached by other coaches at different schools that it's clear that those players have given up on that coach or given up on on the season and at no point have you seen that under keith so uh he he definitely instills uh a love of you know his players and him and he and their players and um you, you can never accuse kevin keats of not being loved uh by his players or his players giving up on him so well I feel like we're giving wrestling short shrift by not mentioning the results there. Should should we do? Should that be covered maybe next uh, week? Well, I don't. I don't know the wrestling necessarily. I mean, other than you know, they had two All Americans, obviously, uh -huh. um, and then uh, Trent Hadley finishing uh, second overall. It was not a it was not a great showing for wrestling right. um, as a team. Uh, I think they're a little frustrated with the result going in, feeling like. They had a chance to come away top four, bring some hardware home. Uh, it was it was not a good first day. They you know four wrestlers lost on the first day, and then they sent six to second round, and then um, a lot of them ended up in consolations and had to fight back. But 
you know, as, as a team overall, not the, not the greatest showing, but, um, you know, it had been great if Trent Hadley had been able to, to cap it off with the national championship. Yeah. Uh, but Aaron Brooks, the guy that has continued to, uh, to be his bugaboo throughout um, his tenure, both of them moved up to 197 <laughs> and then faced off against each right. other. They went from 174 to 197 the same year. Uh, and, you know, and I think it was Trent wanting to say, hey, I want to face this guy again. I want to beat him, and he loses six to zero in the final. So, uh, you know, again, do it six to one. I apologize. Yes. Yeah. So, um, again, not a you know not a great overall showing for wrestling. Uh, I th- I feel like you know they would have loved to have, to have come away with more. Uh, but gymnastics, yes. fifth ACC championship of the year for NC State. It's the second time they've ever done that as a program. Gymnastics was fantastic. Uh, they've done it in the regular season. They did it in the postseason. Uh, and come away with the you know the second time uh, in in ACC history back back to back ACC back to back <laughs> you know thirty years apart but back to back so yes. uh, just an incredible run of success for uh, for NC State yeah. in gymnastics and and forty years I think if I'm not if oh the, yeah, yeah, yeah forty it, years yeah, yes, so, yes 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 um, yeah. Yeah. So yes, we'll send on uh, on an update note there. Uh, <laughs> uh, congrats to the gymnastics team. Just a, a, an incredible uh, win for the title there. Uh, just a dominant performance all season long. Yes. Never so, lost a never lost a meet. So yeah, in ACC. Yeah. Well, Scott, thank you so much for taking some time. It's a pleasure getting to meet your family who joined us here this evening. Uh, it was great. Uh, we got to see the whole clan come out and uh, hang out with us. It was great. Uh, and uh, I hope that we have uh, more opportunity in the coming weeks to talk about some uh, some good results with you. Uh, I, uh, I I feel like you know ever since the title, it's all been kind of gravy from here on out. But uh, I want to keep winning. This is a fun feeling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like you said, you get to this point, it's kind of like yeah, you just two right. two more games and you're you know. in the final four. That's <laughs> well, and I think that's the the beauty of it. I think that they think in their mind that there is no team they can't beat right you know they've yeah. proven that they're good enough they have the confidence and, and they're riding on high now again you still got to play the game and anything can happen but they've proven to themselves that you know we've accomplished what we want to accomplish but we're not done yet and they they're, beat not, a, they're, they're not afraid to match up against anybody they beat a three seed and then the number one seed or one of the one seeds uh in this ncaa tournament to win an acc title so yeah i mean the the proof is right there it's funny you say that because that's exactly what Kevin Keats said after the Duke game. He said, there's not a team that we've played that we don't feel like we can beat. And then they beat all five of them, yeah. you know, all five teams in the, uh, in the ACC tournament to get to this point. I think there's, there's a belief not only inward now but also outward too from, from the fans. So, yeah. um, again, amazing success. Men's basketball, women's basketball, both in the Sweet 16. Uh, and then – there's only two teams in the entire country that can say they had both of their teams in the Sweet 16, along with I think there's like Creighton and UConn have a chance to have both. Uh, it looks like UConn will send both, uh, but when it comes to football, <laughs> which UConn and, and Creighton, uh, neither one are one's not successful, one uh, is, doesn't have a football team. Uh, there's only three te- or two teams in the entire country that sent uh, both their teams to the Sweet 16 and had a bowl game. That's NC State and Duke. Wow. <laughs> yep. You win a bar bet with that one. Well, and then, you know, Duke's coach didn't even coach in that one. So, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, Scott, I'm sorry that we spoiled the surprise. You know, okay. The women's team did advance to the Sweet 16. I, I was going to figure it out eventually. So, <laughs> <laughs> I follow too many okay. state fans and, and, <laughs> and podcasters and media yeah. uh, <laughs> to not see what the score was right. on the way over here. Yeah. You've got to put blinders on and turn your phone off and, yes. and all of that. Uh, All right, well, for Scott Wood and Corey, this is James saying so long here on the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast.